your news and sports radio network. And now WBEN Buffalo, broadcasting at 930 kilohertz, begins another day of service to the Niagara frontier. Our studio to transmitter link, WEF 90, operates at 949 megahertz. Tonight's Mystery Theater is brought to you by AM and A's, downtown and six suburban stores, including the new Lockport store. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... you join me? It's dark and cozy inside here. The perfect place to curl up and listen to another tale of suspense and danger. This time, it's the story of a very unusual get-rich-quick scheme. But even though our story is educational and instructive, we don't want you to listen in the hopes of duplicating our hero's plan for instant wealth. You may find it difficult to begin where he begins by dying a violent death. Because after that, what do you do for an encore? Jerry, this is crazy. You'll never get away with it. I am getting away with it. But they'll find out. No, they'll never catch on. And before I'm through, I'll be the richest dead man in the world. mystery drama, Bury Me Again, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Michael Tolan. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You've seen the Budweiser commercials on television, and maybe you've wondered how long people have been putting that famous Bud label on things. Well, not as long as the brewers of Bud have been putting things on the label. Things like a list of Bud's most important ingredients. Quote, brewed by our original process from the choicest hops, rice, and best barley malt. And things like the following statement. This is the famous Budweiser beer. We know of no brand produced by any other brewer, which costs so much to brew and age. Our exclusive Beechwood aging produces a taste, a smoothness, and a drinkability you will find in no other beer at any price. Unquote. Yes, brewing beer right does make a difference. Read the Bud label. Taste the king of beers, and you'll agree. When you say Budweiser, you said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Gracious, elegant, luxurious sterling silver for radiant holiday tables. Join Amade's fantastic silver club plan for stupendous savings of 25 to 50% on flatware from the finest silversmiths. No down payment, no finance charge, and up to 25 months to pay. 24-piece sets from Gorham. Services for 4, 8, or 12 by International. Lunch three-piece place weddings. Heirloom sterling patterns by Oneida Silversmiths. 16-piece starter sets from Reed and Barton. Trade in your present silver for savings on all patterns by toll. Choose Wallace Sterling's 24-piece service for eight and get a chest free. And save on all open stock pieces from these famous companies. For gift giving or for your own, the elegance of sterling silver at low, low prices. Join AM Day's Silver Club plan now. No down payment, no finance charge, and up to 25 months to pay. At all seven AM Day stores. Some people think that the sound of a train whistle fading into the distance is probably the most melancholy sound in the world. But the people aboard those trains which crisscross the country can be melancholy too. As the crack Chicago Express streaks into the dark stretch of track between Union Station and the town of Fairmont, 
One of those passengers is staring gloomily into his own reflection in the suit-darkened window. It may be interesting to follow his thoughts. Minus $10,000. Minus 10000 That's where I'm at after 36 years of living. 36 years of working and sweating and dreaming dreams that never had a prayer of coming through. I owed McGinnis the same six grand I'd owed him for two years, even after making him payments amounting to twice that much. And then there were the bills. The dentist, the credit card company, the automobile dealer. <laughs> no. No, I could scratch that one. The car had been repossessed just the other day. That's why I was taking the train instead of driving to Fairmont. Not that I expected it to do much good. The chances of hitting my maiden Aunt Hilda for money were pretty slim. But when you're down, you'll try anything. And with the thought of McGinnis and his goons coming around for payday again, I was ready for anything at all. But maybe not quite ready for what happened. Pardon me, is this seat taken? No, 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 no. It's all right. Sit down. Oh, thanks. You know, I haven't been in a dining car in years. I didn't know they they still have them. (laughs) Heck, some people don't know there are still trains running. (laughs) I guess that's so. Everybody thinks in terms of flying these days. I don't like to fly myself. Heck, for most trips, you don't save any time anyway. By the time you get to and from the airport... Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, you do a lot of traveling? Not if I uh, can avoid it. Well, I can't, unfortunately. I'm one of those traveling salesmen you hear about. But you know something? I never met a farmer's daughter in my life. (laughs) Um, How do you get a drink here? I've been wondering that for the last 15 minutes. It looks like you've got a drink. No, sure. That's my own private stock. I always carry a pint bottle with me on these long train trips just to break the monotony. Yeah. Come on, give me a water glass. Hey, that's very kind of you. My pleasure. Well, here's looking at you. Right. And here's to the farmer's daughter. Maybe you'll meet her this trip. <laughs> just hope my wife doesn't find out. <laughs> dinner companion wasn't the most scintillating conversationalist in the world, but he was company, and I guess I needed that. I also didn't mind the private stock he carried. Every drink aboard that train cost a buck and a half. So when he told me that he had still another bottle, I suggested we continue our talk in the club car. The only thing wrong was that he did all the talking, and the more he drank, the more he talked. Money, my friend. M-U-N-N-Y. That's the answer to the whole darn thing. You take my word for it. Tell me, give you that happiness, baloney. You just walk away, pal. Walk away. You don't have to convince me, brother. I've already been convinced. Listen, listen. You ever figure it out? I mean, figure out one of those things like assets and liabilities? That's all I've got, liability. You know what I mean, like how much you're worth, how much you're really worth. Well, I can tell you, you, me... Everybody else, we're worth more dead than alive. Am I right? Am I right? Yeah, you're right. You betcha. That's what insurance is all about. You betcha. That's what I mean. That's what insurance is all about. You're you're not an insurance salesman, are you? <laughs> no, not me. No, I'm not a liquor salesman either. <laughs> Too bad about that, isn't it? Hey, bottle's almost empty. Don't worry, friend. Don't you worry. There's more where I came from, for her. Plenty more whiskey, plenty more talk. Until something happened that sobered up the evening fast. I, I don't know how long I was unconscious. Judging from the things that were happening around me, it couldn't have been more than a few minutes after the crash. After the express had plowed into the freight train and somehow been switched into a path. I felt lousy, but I was still in one piece. When the impact came, I fell against the leather sofa and it toppled over me. When the hard stuff came down, I had a built-in bomb shelter. Nobody else around me was so lucky. I saw the traveling salesman. 
And I knew he was never going to meet that farmer's daughter. Then, I saw something else. The money that peeked out of his wallet, still nice and green. I had the sense to grab the wallet before I crawled out of the overturned car. I stood up as soon as I felt cold air on my face. Within seconds after I left the wreck, the tiny fire that had been burning all around got together in one giant ball of flame. I never saw such a hungry fire in my life. I knew there wasn't going to be much left of anything or anyone. And then I saw the people. They were all over the place, dozens of them, flashing searchlights, shouting to each other. Hey, mister! Hey! Yeah? What, what is it? Are you okay? Yes, I... I'm all right. I just uh, a little shook up. Oh, they're putting up a first aid station down this line. Uh, want me to help you over there? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Thanks. No, I'd better take you there. Oh, well, okay. Thanks. Hey, listen, what, what town is this? We're just outside of Hopkins Falls. We heard the crash all the way to town. It sounded like a bomb went off. <laughs> first aid station, and a guy in a dirty white uniform helped me inside. What's your name? I, uh, I, I, I can't think. I'm, I'm all mixed up. Yes, well, maybe you'd better lie down for a while, mister. No, 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 I'm, I'm okay. We're setting up a hospital station. We'll have a car take you there if you like. It'll be a while before the ambulance gets here. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not hurt. I'm just, I'm just mixed up. Is, is it far to town? You're really in no condition to walk. Just tell me how far it is. Well, um, about a quarter of a mile in that direction. Thanks. I'd... That's that's all I want to know. Well, Hopkins Falls wasn't much of a town. There were a bunch of frame houses leaning on each other for support, and the only electric sign in the place was the one I wanted. It said hotel. It took me quite a while to find the desk clerk lurking behind the rubber plants in the lobby. He looked at me curiously and spun the register in my direction. I chuckled when I saw the empty page. When I asked for a room with bath, he almost swallowed his store teeth. I signed the register Benedict Arnold and went up to the shabby room on the second floor. When I closed the door behind me, all I could do was head for that bed. The springs gave in with a rusty sigh, but I couldn't care less. Sleep hit me like a TKO. I woke up the next morning with a pain in my hip. At first I thought I'd broken a bone. But then I realized it was only the bulge of a wallet in my trouser pocket. I counted the money. A hundred and ten bucks. It would be enough for a little while. Then I picked up the phone. Uh, hello, this is Mr. Arnold, room 202. You got any room service in this place? Yeah, breakfast. Yeah, that's exactly what I want. Fried eggs, bacon, toast, coffee. Oh, uh, how about the morning paper? The paper in yet? Any uh, news about the wreck? Fine, good. Be sure to send that up, too. The breakfast was no better than I expected. The toast was soggy, the coffee watery, and the eggs almost inedible. But the local paper, that was something else. The train wreck had taken over the whole rag, all four sheets of it. It was probably the biggest news that ever hit this whistle stop. I turned to the casualty list. It wasn't complete, but it had what I wanted. So I grabbed the phone. Um, I want to make a call, long distance. Hello, operator. I'd like to place a call to Chicago, person to person, Mrs. Gerald Horton, 1240 Lafayette Street. Now, I'm in room 202. The name is... Ger- no, I mean, uh, Arnold. First initial B. Hello? Myrna? Is that you, Myrna? Who is this? Is anybody with you? It's Jerry. Jerry? Where are you calling from? A town called Hopkins Corner or something like that. Listen, are you alone? Well, yes, of course I'm alone. But why are you talking this way? Because this hotel has walls like tissue paper, that's why. 
Myrna, did you read about the wreck? The wreck? What are you talking about? The train, the Chicago train. It hit something, a stalled freight train. Dozens of people were killed. Oh, my God. Jerry, are you okay? Quiet. Yes, I'm okay. I got a little banged up. Nothing serious. Oh, thank God. But why aren't you in a hospital? I don't need a hospital. I told you I'm not hurt. I'm just... dead. What? You heard me. I'm dead, honey. What are you talking about? Myrna, listen carefully. There's been a mistake out here. A big mistake. And we're going to make the most of it, understand? No. Well, listen and you will. They got me down on the local casualty list. They think I'm dead. Do you get what I'm saying? They've listed me as dead. But how can that be? Well, I must have helped it along a little. I switched wallets with a guy. His was fatter than mine, but he had no use for it anyway. But then the whole train caught fire. He must have been burned beyond recognition. But the wallet was okay. Why, that's awful. You have to tell them. No, I don't have to tell them a thing. Why should I? But what for? No, now listen. What's the only valuable thing we own? What? You know about the insurance policy? Yes. Seventy-five thousand dollars. Seventy-five thousand. More money than we could save in a lifetime. But we can't collect it. Not if you're alive. I'm going to stay dead, Myrna. Understand? Jerry. You're going into mourning for me. Then you're going to get a check for $75,000 from the insurance company. You're going to slap that money into the bank. Then we're going to wait a while and leave town. You and me and the money makes three. Now do you get it? Jerry, that's illegal. What do you mean illegal? We're only ripping off an insurance company, honey. That's what I call fair game. Well, we've just heard an old adage disproved. That dead men tell no tales. Obviously, here is one dead man who is doing exactly that. A tale of deceit and deception. And, very possibly, danger. We'll find out how good a job our friend does of staying dead when I return shortly with Act Two. If you take a look at the new 1975 cars, it doesn't take long to notice the European influence is strong. And to be sure, there are some new American cars that rival the Europeans, one being Buick's new Skylark SR. But don't consider a Skylark SR because of its touring car interior or its rather rakish profile. Consider it because it's a Buick, possessing many of Buick's nicer innovations, like the new Buick V6, a peppery little engine that spits out a plentiful amount of torque while sipping a surprisingly small amount of gasoline. And if you wish, Skylark SR can abound with creature comforts seldom found on cars this size, with available items like Cruise Master Speed Control, AM FM Stereo. But you've heard enough. Now you need to see and drive a Skylark SR. And try to remember, it's not a European touring car. It's a Buick. Buick. Dedicated to the free spirit in just about everyone. The strangest thing happened last night when I was walking home from work. It was almost dark. And then I saw someone. A woman struggling to change a tire. I stopped. She stiffened. I think she was afraid of me. And then something strange happened. We talked. I mean, really talked. There by the roadside, changing the tire. She told me how scared she was. She wanted help, but was afraid of the kind of help she might get. I told her I had fears like that, too. And I think she understood. Then she drove away. And I didn't even get her name. But I listened to her talk. And she listened to me, too. And you know, that made me feel... A word for active listening from the Mennonite churches. Jerry Horton didn't get to see much of the town of Hopkins Falls. He spent the next few days in his room, thinking, drinking, and making plans. It was a pity. The quiet, rustic atmosphere and the countryside might have soothed 
the savage temperament of the man. But Jerry Horton was far too excited by an image of the future. However, since this is Jerry's story, we'll let him tell you the rest. The 110 bucks lasted me five days. It bought me a new suit of clothes at the local emporium, my room and meals, and a bus ticket back to Chicago. I bought myself a cardboard valise, too. I figured a traveling man with a suitcase was less obvious in a crowd. On Friday morning, I put the local phone book, the Gideon Bible, and a couple of hotel towels into the valise and said goodbye. It was a long bus ride, but it seemed short to me. I had all kinds of things to think about. Plans for spending that money. Thinking about McGinnis's face when I finally handed him the 6000 I owed him, all in one neat bundle. <laughs> hey, that was an idea. I put it all in $1 bills and make him stay up half the night counting it. And if I know McGinnis, that's exactly what he would do. And then I was back in Chicago, ready to call good old Myrna. Hello? Myrna? Jerry! For God's sake, don't say my name. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you alone? the bus terminal. Oh, I've been so scared. You have no idea how scared I've been. What for? Well, I'm just so nervous about the whole thing. What's been happening? Well, they sent your body back. The funeral was Tuesday. Good. <laughs> Great. Was it a nice crowd? Well, not too big. Sandy and Jane couldn't make it, but Dorothy and Tom were there, and, and Mother was going to fly in from L.A., but I told her not to bother. I mean... Well, it seemed silly. You didn't tell her anything? Oh, no, of course not. Do you think I'm crazy? Do you think I could tell her that it was some perfect stranger I was putting in the ground? Oh, Jerry, it was awful. I mean, we picked out that plot together and everything. I, I, I was going to be right next to Never you. mind that stuff. We've got more important things to worry about. Living things. Oh, what are you going to do now? I don't know yet. I'm broke. I don't even have enough money for a hotel room. But you can't come here. I know I, I can't think... come there, but I've got to eat. So you got to help me. Look, you uh, you put about $300 in an envelope and address it to... Uh, to John uh, Nolan, care of the Montgomery Hotel. Did you get that name? Y yes, John Nolan, Montgomery Hotel. Don't write it down. You can remember it. Yeah, John Nolan, care of the Montgomery. I'll check in there this morning. Don't try to reach me. That's just asking for trouble. You got it? But what if somebody recognizes you? Don't worry about it. You know the Montgomery's out of our class. So try and make it small bills, okay? No use attracting more attention than I have to. Okay? Yes. Okay. Oh, Jerry. I hope we're doing the right thing. You'll see how right it is when that money comes in, Marna. <laughs> I spent that night in the bus terminal. I hunted out the softest bench and stashed my things under it. When I woke up, I had 19 bones out of place. But I was still feeling chipper. I went into the terminal lavatory and washed up as best I could. It was a fine, sunny day out, and the weather suited my mood. You know how it is. Some days, everything goes right. I walked a dozen blocks to the Montgomery Hotel... It was out of my class, all right. Was, that is. A chunk of white sandstone rising 40 stories from the street in straight, clean lines, ringed by a fence of evenly spaced trees. The doorman looked like he'd won every decoration from the Congressional Medal on down. It felt good walking on the wine-colored carpet that led into the plush lobby, knowing there was money and a hot shower waiting for me inside. I walked up to the desk like a bored millionaire and uh, scratched my unshaven cheek in a kind of wry manner like I was a playboy who was out on the town all night. Yes, sir. May I help you? I, uh, I'd like a room, please. Did you have a reservation? No, I don't. But can you fix me up with something anyway? Yes, sir. I'm sure we can. If you'll just sign the register. Um, I believe you may be holding some mail for me. I told some friends I'd be stopping here. What name, sir? Uh, Nolan. John Nolan. Well, let me check. No. 
No, I don't see anything for... Oh, wait a minute. Here it is. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Front. My room at the Montgomery wasn't fancy. Just a nice room with not much of a view. But I liked it better after a shower and shave. And when I flopped on the big sofa bed, I opened the envelope, lit a cigarette, and counted the money. There were 240 bucks in it, and a note that said, sorry, all I could get, M. Well, it didn't really matter. It would be enough to take care of me for a few days. Then the insurance agent would be around to see Myrna. And money like this would be only car fare. I felt so good that I decided to spend some of it on the best meal I could buy in the hotel restaurant. I was just finishing up when my luck threatened to turn. Well, for Pete's sake, it, 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 it's Lefty. Is this Lefty? You in high school, right? Uh, I'm sorry. I think you must have the wrong guy. Hey, hey, hey did I change that much? <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe I have. I don't know where all the hair went. Uh, down the sink, I guess. Uh, Douglas is the name, remember? Kenny Douglas. No, I'm afraid I, uh, I'm afraid I don't. Oh, well, I, I can't be that wrong. I've got a good memory for faces. Uh, not so great on names, maybe, but they uh, called you Lefty because of the baseball team. But, uh, I'm sorry, mister. I must look like this friend of yours, but I'm not him. I never went to Union High. I never went to any high school, as a matter of fact. Well, I could have sworn. And as I, you I... can see, I'm eating with my right hand. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, but you sure look like the guy, or the way he would look 20 years later. I'm, uh, I'm sorry to bother you. <laughs> time the guy had left my table, I was covered in sweat from head to foot. Oh, I remember Kenny Douglas all right. I think I still had his monogrammed cigarette case in his shoebox at home. He was a snotty rich kid. It had been a pleasure to rip him off. But right now, it was a relief to see him leave. And a relief to switch the fork back to my left hand. After the third day, I started getting anxious. Myrna, it's Jerry. Can you talk? Uh, uh, no, not right now. Some of the girls are over, uh, you know. All right. Just be careful what you say. Just answer yes or no, understand? I can hardly hear you. Now, just be quiet and listen. Has the insurance company contacted you at all? Yes. There was a man here only this morning. A man? Yes, from the claim department. Well, why are they sending somebody from the claim department? There's nothing to claim. I'm dead. Well, he was here just the same. He said it might take a while before the payment was made. He was he was very nice. I don't care if he was tall, dark, and handsome. What's this baloney about it taking a while? Well, it's a lot of money. 150000 is an awful lot of money. What are you talking about? Our policy was for seventy five grand. Yes, but there's a double indemnity clause, you see? I, I mean, the face value doubles because of you being... I, I, I mean, because of the accident. A hundred and fifty... My God, that's a fortune. We're rich. We're really rich. The only thing is, they have to make sure. Sort of what? The identification, don't you see? Everybody was so burned up in that terrible... For wreck. Pete's sake, I was identified. I read my name in the paper on the casualty list. Well, he, he said it'd be all right. He said it was just a matter of a couple of days. It better be all right. I'm running out of cash. I won't be able to afford the hotel bill. Well, I just can't send you any more money. I don't have a cent. All right. All right, then. But when you get that check in your hands, you better get on that phone right away. Understand? Yes, I understand. John Nolan, Montgomery Hotel. Don't do anything with the money. Just wait for my instructions. All right. I'll wait. But I'm still so scared. <laughs> $150,000. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't imagine money like that. I, I kept seeing the way that check would look, that long string of numbers. I began to see visions of things I'd wanted since the day I was born. It was all I could do to keep myself from running down to the auto showroom and placing an order for the biggest, shiniest car in the window. But I had to wait. The money wasn't there yet. There was still one more step to go. I was a little worried about Myrna's visitor from the insurance company. 
But I knew that things would work out all right. This was my lucky time of life, and nothing was going to spoil it. Then, just one day later... Oh, Mr. Nolan. Uh, yes? There was a call for you while you were out this afternoon. It was a lady, Mrs. Nolan, I think. Uh-huh. Thanks very much. My hands were shaking so bad that I could hardly dial Myrna's number. When she didn't answer right away, I started to panic. She wouldn't be calling me unless it was all set. She must have the money in her hand. And I had to make sure that it went to the right place. It wasn't that I suspected Myrna of any hanky-panky. I had no reason to suspect her of anything. But who knows what someone will do when they're looking at a piece of paper that says 150000 Hello? Myrna, it's me. Oh, thank heavens. I was getting so worried. Where were you? The phone must have rung ten times. Oh, I, I just got in this second. I was down at the insurance company. You went there to get the money? They asked me to come down, Jerry. I was so upset. I almost fainted. Well, don't worry about it. You're the grieving widow. You're supposed to be upset. But you don't understand. They didn't call me about the money. Only about... Oh, well, I, I don't know what you call it. Uh, exhume something. What? But Jerry, they want to open your grave. They can't do that. It's against the law. They said they wanted my cooperation. They asked me to sign a paper. Don't do it. Don't sign a thing. They can't force you to do such a thing. Well, they said that if I didn't sign it, they'd have to get a court order. They're bluffing. They can't do anything like that. They've already identified that body as me, and once is good enough. Oh, Jerry, what should I do? What should I tell them? Should I get a lawyer? No, don't get a lawyer yet. Let me think. Let me figure out something and call you back. There's got to be something I can figure out. As Robert Burns once told us, the best laid plans of mice and men off go astray. Even the plans of dead men, it seems. But I think we have a resourceful gentleman here who won't let a mere detail stand between him and his dream. Will the insurance investigators create a rude awakening? Or will our hero find some way to put the number 150,000 into his little green book? Just wait right there, and I'll return with the answers shortly in Act 3. Give your hand to a friend. Give your heart to your love. But give your cold to contact. The sooner the better. The common cold is a rotten thing. You miss so much. Sneezing, drips, and congestion can drag you down. Then, ask yourself the contact question. Six or three or one. You'd need six cold tablets, two every four hours, or three ounces of cold's liquid, one every four hours, or just one contact for up to 12 hours continuous relief of those symptoms. That's daytime, then nighttime relief. Both the others have things for aches and fever, and the liquid, something for coughs. Not found in Contact 600 Tiny Time Pills. Give your cold to Contact. Six or three or one. Take Contact. Only as directed. Who knows what troubles lurk in the hearts and minds of consumers? The man from the Better Business Bureau knows. Oh, Irene. This new sofa is gone already, and, and... Why, why, what's that inside the cushion, John? It's, oh my heavens, it's crumpled newspaper. How did we ever buy a sofa like this? What can we do? I'll tell you what to do. Who are you, sir? I'm the man from your Better Business Bureau. When you shop for furniture, it's what's inside that counts. Fancy coverings can hide a variety of shoddy workmanship. Read the law label that must be stitched to the furniture. It will tell you the filler material used and buy from a reputable dealer. Oh, thank you, sir. We'll know better next time. Not at all, ma'am. Just another tip from your Better Business Bureau.
It's a time of tension for the man in the Montgomery Hotel. Now every hour seems to stretch ahead interminably. The watch ticking on his wrist seems to have hands made of lead. But as he paces his hotel room, smoking endless cigarettes, downing pots of lukewarm hotel coffee, he seems to have arrived at no solution to his dilemma. And then... Yes? It's me. I told you not to call me direct. I said always leave a message with the desk clerk. I've got to talk to you. All right. What's happening? They got the order, Jerry. Oh, Lord. There was nothing I could do to stop them. They said I was wrong to have you buried so fast. That there was too much money involved. Listen, you... You don't think they suspect anything? No, I, I don't think so. I've been careful, I swear I have. Those insurance guys are sharp, you know. I'm telling you, I haven't done anything wrong. I've been crying my eyes out just as if you really got killed. Everybody keeps telling me that I'm taking it too hard. What they don't know is that I'm scared. All right, all right. Uh, just, just calm down. Maybe things aren't that bad. How could they be worse? You didn't see what I saw after that train wreck. After the explosion. They had pictures in the local papers. The victims didn't look human anymore, I'm telling you. They were just like pieces of, of charcoal. How awful. Even if they open that coffin, they won't see anything but a handful of ashes. So stop worrying. Are you sure, Jerry? I'm sure. At least I think I'm sure. And, and, and what if they figure out that it, it's somebody else? Okay, so we lose the bread. The wrong man got identified. It wasn't anybody's fault, right? And as for me, I guess I'll... Well, I'll be just another runaway husband. Jerry, you don't mean that. No, no, don't worry. You'll be seeing me again. Broke as usual. Unless our luck holds. Pray that it holds, baby. Oh, Jerry. You never call me baby anymore. Never mind what I call you. You call me. The minute anything happens. The next couple of days were the worst of my life. There was nothing I could do but concentrate on that phone. Stare at it. Waiting for it to ring. After a while, I started yelling at it. Ordering it to ring. Like some kind of nut. But it stayed silent. It just stared back at me. Until I got so jumpy that I had to get out of the room. But I wasn't on the street for five minutes before I found myself heading back for the lobby and demanding to know if there'd been any calls for me. The answer was always no. And then, on the morning of the third day after Myrna's call, when I wasn't even thinking about the phone, it rang. Hello? Jerry, it's me. I've been going nuts here. Why didn't you call me before? There was nothing to say. You told me to call you when something happened. Well, something must have happened by now. Did they exhume the body? Yes, they did. Well, go on. Jerry, it, it was just like you said. I didn't see the body, but the insurance man told me about it. He said he felt awful describing it to me, but he thought I should be told. Jerry, there were only ashes in that coffin. Thank the Lord. I, I, I was so scared, but, but it's all right now. Everything is all right. No, it won't be all right until you've got that money. But I do have it. What? That's what I'm calling about. I've got the check. It's right here in front of me. A hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I never knew there was that much money in the world. Okay. Okay, now listen, now listen close. Here's the way we're going to handle it. The first thing you do is deposit the check to the regular account. Yeah, I, I was going to do that this morning. I was so afraid to have such a big check in the house. All right, so deposit it. And then go to the Chemical National Bank, the one on Clover Street, near the Arch. You yeah. know the one I mean? Yes, but, but what for? Just listen and do what I say. You go to that bank and say you want to open a joint savings account for you and your husband... Only now, you're Mrs. John Nolan. Understand? But I can't open an account by myself. Yes, you can sign all the papers there. 
and then collect the forms that I have to sign. Understand? Yes, I see. Put all the forms in an envelope and send them to me here at the Montgomery. All right. I'll get them in the mail as soon as possible. No, you can drop them off in person at the desk. The Montgomery is right around the corner from the bank. Leave it at the front desk for Mr. Nolan. But I don't see how that'll work. Why don't I just cash the check? Shut up and listen to me. This is the safest way to handle it. Once you have the money deposited in our regular checking account, you can write a check for the whole amount to John Nolan. There. Now do you get it? You mean I deposit the money in the new account? That's just what I mean. And after that, well, I'll let you know the rest of the plan. Have you got it all straight? Yes, Jerry. I'll do just what you said. That's my girl. It was cloud nine time. I felt like, like I was floating. Like I was drunk on expensive champagne. And it wouldn't be too long before I was. I was mentally throwing out every shabby suit in my closet and replacing them with custom-made threads. I was so stuffed with dreams that the next few hours passed by in a pink haze. Hello? Mr. Nolan, I have an envelope here for you. Shall I send it up? Yeah, thanks. Send it right up. had followed her instructions perfectly. I filled out the joint account application, signed John Nolan in a sweeping hand, and then took the forms to the Chemical National Bank myself. I wanted them to get a good look at me, because they were going to be seeing me again very soon. Ah, uh, getting cool again, isn't it? Uh, yes. Looks like it'll be a short summer, doesn't it? Uh-huh. Oh, now, let me see... How much are you depositing initially, Mr. Nolan? Well, my wife will be making the first deposit tomorrow morning. Uh-huh. Uh, it'll probably be a big one. See, we're buying a house, and so we're cashing in some uh, stocks. Oh, I see. <laughs> it's uh, too bad we won't be leaving it in the account long enough to collect interest. I might have to withdraw most of it pretty quick. Well, easy come, easy go. <laughs> That's right. Easy come, easy go. She didn't know how funny that was. And two days later, when I strolled back into the Chemical National Bank, the joke was all ready for the punchline. I had the passbook in my hand and happiness in my heart when I walked across the marble floor to the teller's cage marked M-N-O. I caught a glimpse of the bank guard's dark blue uniform. He looked fat and lazy. I stepped up to the window and started to say hello to my girlfriend of the day before. But then I remembered I had a withdrawal slip to make out first. So I smiled apologetically and went to the glass top counter in the center of the room. I copied the number from the passbook and filled out the amount. $20,000. No, I wasn't going to withdraw at all. I was smarter than that. All that bread going in and out so fast, that... That would attract too much notice. I was going to chip away at it, a piece at a time. Oh, hello. I see you didn't waste any time. Nope. Uh, Got to get that deposit down today. Uh-huh. 20000 Well, I'm sure you want a bank check for that, won't you? Uh, yeah, I'd better. I wouldn't want to walk around with that much cash. Oh, one moment, Guy. I have to see an officer. Take your time. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Nolan? Uh, yes? I'm uh, Bill Harkness, assistant manager. Uh, would you mind stepping into my office a moment? What for? Oh, it's just a technical matter regarding your account. Yes, sir. Why, what's the matter with my account? The money's on deposit, isn't it? It says so in my passport. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Everything's in order. But you see, when any large withdrawal is made, we're required to fill out uh, uh, certain forms. Oh, I never heard of anything like that. It won't take long, I promise you. Well, okay. Mm. Uh, this way, please. Now, 
if you'll sit right here. I'll have the form in just a moment. Well, I'd waited almost a month already for this. So I figured I could wait another few minutes. The only thing is, I didn't realize what I was really waiting for until the door opened and Harkness returned. This time he had another man with him and a woman who I supposed was his secretary. Sorry to have been so long, Mr. Nolan. Well, that's okay. Just, uh, just let me get my check and get out of here. I've, I've got things to do. Uh, what sort of things, Mr. Nolan? Oh, I didn't, uh, I didn't get your name. I'm Lieutenant Whalen. Police? Police? Now, yeah, wait a minute. Are, are you implying that I'm doing something illegal by withdrawing money from my own account? You're doing something illegal, all right, Mr. Nolan, so why don't you tell us all about it? Listen, if this is an arrest, I'd sure, like... Sure, 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 I know. You've got rights. You don't have to say anything to incriminate yourself. Well, I've got a few things to say, let me tell you. And who are you? What's the matter, Jerry? Don't you know your own wife? Your own baby? Hey, no, well, wait a minute. My name is Nolan. John Nolan, and I can prove it. I've got a driver's license here. Look at it. And I'm Myrna. Your own loving wife, Jerry. How come you don't recognize me? I know why, Mr. Nolan. Because you really are John Nolan, and the real Jerry Horton is dead. Killed in that train wreck. I should have guessed it the first time you called me. You imitated Jerry's voice okay, and you always talked low. But I should have known you weren't my husband. You took his wallet. That's how you knew how to reach his wife. And Mr. Horton must have told you about his insurance policy. But how, how did it happen? How did you find out? It was the autopsy. It was when they dug up the body again and proved that it was my husband. It was the teeth that did it. And that's how we identify the body, by the dental work. As soon as the insurance people paid me that money, I knew that it had to be Jerry in that coffin and that it was going to be somebody else in this bank. Now, we told Mrs. Horton to go along with you until you actually wrote that withdrawal slip. And that's all the evidence we need, friend. Well, you can't blame a guy for trying, can you? So I guess the money is all yours, Mrs. Horton. Myrna. Congratulations. Listen, you may not believe this, but I give half this money to have Jerry back. Of course, the moral of our story is that crime doesn't pay, even if the insurance companies do. And now you see why we don't recommend our hero's method of getting rich. Because now, Mr. Nolan is going to be going somewhere that boasts no champagne, no fancy cars, and very little change of wardrobe. I'll be back shortly. How many things can your family do together? Go to a movie? Go to a circus? Go on a picnic? Go on a vacation. Face it, in today's America, family fun is hard to come by. And with busy schedules, just getting the family together is not an easy thing to do. How would you like to have a little family fun every week? How would you like to learn together? How would you like to grow together? And how would you like to help your son get an edge on growing up? Cub Scouting is helping families like yours be a family. It's your help to ours. Today's Cub Scout program is just as much for families as it is for boys. So when your son wants to join a Cub Scout pack, remember to take along the whole family. That's what Cub Scouting is all about. For the Cub Scout pack nearest you, call the Boy Scouts of America. They're in the white pages of your phone book. to admit that there's something fascinating about confidence games. 
They say that the essential ingredient of a good swindle is to play upon the greed of the victim. So, the next time someone offers you a way to make an easy dollar, make sure you're not dealing with the wrong man. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Vicky Vola, Gilbert Mack, Mary Jane Higby, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Our radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. <laughs> G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Mystery Theater has been brought to you by AM and A's, downtown and six suburban stores, including the new Locksport store. This is WBEN Buffalo.